right, we'll go ahead and get started without Cloudflare, unfortunately. I'll go ahead and attribute those questions to the remaining panelists. Um, myself as the moderator, Dr. Richard Zhao from NS Focus. Um, Matthew Prince is currently not here from Cloudflare. Carlos Morales from Arbor Networks. And Kevin Hatfield is being replaced by Matt Mavi, Staminus Communications. We'll go ahead and get those slides updated so you have the correct copies when you log into the website. I'll go ahead and tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Jeff Lyon. I started into DDoS mitigation in about 1999. Been running Black Lotus ever since. We're a DDoS mitigation provider on the service side and have actually dabbled into the appliance market a little bit. My purpose here is not to talk about Black Lotus, but is to give everyone here in the room a real technical discussion about how to protect yourself from DDoS attacks. So the question here is what can the small, medium web hosts do to protect themselves? Most DDoS attacks that I attend or that I hear of are why a certain appliance is good or why you need this cloud security service or why you need to use my you know, clean pipe service. And that's not why we're here today. We're gonna go ahead and open up with opening remarks from the panelists and we're going to go straight into a very educational, technical discussion. Um, my background, when I had stated that in the first bullet there, when the first US CERT advisories came out in 99, that's basically when I jumped into the business and started up Black Lotus. Um, DDoS mitigation has really been a huge product probably ever since about 2007. So there was that earlier, early era from say 99 to 2007 where many of us were in the market, but it wasn't a huge business. Now that the attacks are growing exponentially, DDoS mitigation is a real threat, and it's time that hosting providers figure out how they're going to protect themselves and how to protect their customers so that they remain relevant in the market. Uh, Carlos, your opening remarks. Sure. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Um, Carlos Morales from Arbor Networks. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with Arbor, we're, we're uh, somewhat of a dominant player within the DDoS space, just providing systems and solutions, mostly in, in uh, the service provider space where DDoS is really prominent over the last few years, and then moving to the hosting space, down to the enterprise and whatnot over the years. Um, I've been with Arbor nine years, so I, right, right at the onset of, of where DDoS started making its way into the market was sort of looked at like worms and, and some other smaller type, type threats, all the way to you know, the more, far more prominent anonymous-based attacks that, that are happening today. So my, my background is, is technical. I, hand, I, uh, I, I was a sales engineer, moved up, uh, and I currently run the Global Sales Engineering Group for Arbor. So I have a lot of experience in, in deploying solutions on the DDoS front and look forward to sharing with you guys. Thank you, Carlos. And uh, we're still looking for Matt Prince. I hear that he's on his way, so we'll go ahead and give him a seat once he arrives. Uh, Dr. Richard Zhao, NS Focus, your opening comments? Yeah. I I am the uh, Chief Strategy Officer of End Focus. Uh, for some of the audience, End Focus might be a new face, but we are a uh, veteran at Asia Pacific. We start to provide anti DDoS uh, products to the top carrier and the internet uh, operators from 2002. Uh, as the ch uh, Chief Strategy Officer, I manage the secure labs of End Focus and the research team. As strategy uh, product planning for the company. So it's my good pleasure to be part of the panel. Thank you, Doctor. And Matt Mavi, go ahead and speak on behalf of Staminus Communications in place of uh, Kevin Hatfield. Our company, Staminus, uh, we, we actually started in 1998. We didn't begin by offering DDoS mitigation, but we did succumb to DDoS attacks before anybody else really knew what they were. So we had to come up with a homegrown solution because nobody else was really in the market. In 1998, nobody even understood DDoS attacks. So we built our own solution and since then we've been in the market providing mitigation services to companies uh, and providing hosting services uh, as well. So we're a dedicated server shop, cloud hosting shop that provides mitigation on top of those as well as remote uh, remote uh, DDoS mitigation using various tactics and techniques as well. Uh, we're also diving into appliances. Thank you, Matt. All right, the first question is for you, Matt, in place of Kevin Hatfield. Um, this question came from Derek Morris at Pingzine via Facebook. Is it possible to have a network 100% safe from DDoS attacks? And what are some of the flaws and issues that allow these attacks? Kind of. So I can theoretically say yes, and you can 
technically drop off a server from the face of the internet and it'll be 100% protected, but at some point or another, you're always going to have some new technique that can uh, bring down a server. So, I mean, I'll throw out an example. For example, you have DDoS mitigation facing the internet, and you get someone inside your network launching a LAN attack. At that point, what happens? Well, then you, know, you have to set up security for that as well. So, sure, you can protect every single aspect of your network, but at that point, is it worth the cost? Maybe, maybe not. Thank you, Matt. And Matthew Prince from Cloudflare just joined us. Matt, your opening remarks? Sorry, I'm late. <laughs> Let's go ahead and give a couple. I was, uh, I was downstairs giving out Nerf guns, so if anyone hasn't had any, we have another 150 that we're, we're uh, saving for tomorrow. Uh, so I'm from Cloudflare. Uh, we make the internet faster and protect websites from bad guys. We didn't originally start out as a DDoS mitigation company. But it turns out if you put half a million customers behind you, um, uh, occasionally they get attacked. Uh, the core value of Cloudflare has always been that it gets smarter the more traffic that passes through the system. And so um, we learned very, very quickly how to deal with very large attacks. And today, you know, we're out of breath, I ran. Uh, we are attacked. Um, I, I actually don't know that there's any any company on earth that sees more DDoS attacks than we do on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. We've gotten very, very good at stopping them. So um, quite different than a lot of other uh, folks. We try to, we try to make, um, uh, I kind of, I, we try to make it incredibly affordable to actually stop these attacks. Like my, I see my job as helping you sleep better at night and you shouldn't have to pay to sleep better at night. And so even our free service offers a very, very robust DDoS mitigation service. And then we have higher tier services that actually have SLAs that get tied to that. So um, we're trying to really reinvent the market in that sense. So that's what we do. And excited to listen to these guys and, and hopefully catch my breath. Thank you, Matt. As we move forward, our questioning is going to be more technical in nature. So I'd like to remind our panelists to make sure that we're speaking of specific vectors, specific technologies that can be, or measures that can be implemented to mitigate attacks, and not so much exactly what appliance or what specific service should be used. Because I'd like everyone in this audience to step away with the knowledge of what can you do for yourselves right now that may or may not require you to uh, put money on the table. My next question is for Dr. Richard Zhao and his focus. Doctor, what synergies exist between enterprise DDoS mitigation systems and enterprise DDoS mitigation service providers, and how should a typical small-medium business web host approach DDoS mitigation on behalf of its customers? Okay. So, um, the enterprise DDoS mitigation system and its service are two main uh, major approaches in the market. So they, uh, from the uh, technology perspective, uh, they have very common uh, foundation. They can share a lot of best practices to uh, fight against the DDoS attacks. Even they have different business, uh, business uh, approaches to uh, the processes and the uh, uh, business models. But they are two major uh, approaches in the market. So. Um, uh, even they have, uh, they are different sectors, uh, subsectors in the market. But uh, uh, we believe uh, they uh, they can share something uh, to uh, to protect the uh, end user. That's the most if essential things uh, in the market. As, um, in terms of my bullet point there, I guess my question was along the lines of. What's an effective strategy? Should these smaller providers be establishing bastion hosts or relying on a cloud security provider or putting a little bit more money down getting the enterprise solutions provider? How do those work together and how should that decision be approached? Uh, actually, it's not only a pure technology uh, question, it's a business question. So it's uh, similar to uh, the uh, cloud computing strategy at, uh, at this moment. Most uh, enterprise CIO should consider uh, for for the uh, uh, typical uh, SMB uh, web host, um, they um, may consider 
DIY approach or choose a service provider to, to make it. Uh, it depends the the IT uh, uh, operation size and the, uh, the the budget and how critical the service is. Uh, in generally, uh, if the uh, uh, enterprise doesn't have an uh, in-house uh, IT professional expertise, it's very uh, is a um, better for them to outsource it to the service provider to get a more uh, professional service. And but it for the uh, uh, for the enterprise with very critical um, uh, security requirements, they may do a hybrid approach. That means they have some in-house uh, professionals working together with the uh, professional service provider and even some on-site on uh, appliances. I'm not sure if that answered the question. I appreciate that. Thank you, Doctor. My next question is for Matthew Prince. Matt, what are some of the challenges that one faces in dealing with Layer 7 application attacks? And what commercial solutions are best suited to address these issues? And finally, what can a hosting company's administrator do to combat a Layer 7 attack without necessarily relying on any service? Sure. Um, so, so again, just to, I don't know what the, the technical sophistication is of people in the audience. So Layer 7 is referring to uh, the OSI model, and the seven, Layer 7 is the application layer. And so um, traditionally, denial of service attacks have largely been uh, targeted at Layer 3 or Layer 4 where they are either trying to fill the entire application, uh, or they're trying to f essentially fill the pipe up with either a bunch of garbage SIN traffic or, or other uh, traffic that comes in. Increasingly, uh, we're seeing layer seven attacks that are targeting the underlying application, um, doing things like opening a, a large number of connections uh, to Apache um, and not closing them quickly. So uh, like a slow read, or the slow Loris attack, or various connections that will actually slow things down. Um, and the the answer to how you can solve, I mean, there are again a lot of different ways that you uh, can solve that. If you want to solve that without relying on a on a on a provider in order to solve it, then you know some of the best things to do are actually go through your stack and think about in terms of what you're offering to your customers, and think about what applications perform better for these types of attacks. So, um, for example, um, if you switch away from a, uh, a, a web uh, server like Apache, which every time a connection comes into Apache, there's actually a bit of memory that gets allocated. So, at the end of the day, denial of service attacks are all about exhausting some resource or another. And so, if Apache is allocating a little bit of memory each time, you open enough connections, eventually you're going to fill up that entire uh, memory pool and that will um, uh, terminate your Apache connections. Um, so a better architected application, so um, we would, we were friends with the Nginx guys, it will hold up to a lot more connections, it's much more resilient um, to this type of attack, it's an open source um, project and to the extent that you can support that for your customers, that's something that will help mitigate some of these um, layer seven types of attacks. The one good news, really good piece of news with layer seven attacks is that the identity of the attacker, and I don't mean it's someone in Kazakhstan, I mean the IP address which is coming in isn't forged in those attacks. And so if you can start to build a database of the layer seven attacks that you're seeing, then over time you can actually use that data in order to mitigate those attacks going forward. And so if you are a provider that's seeing a large number of attacks, logging those attacks, taking that information, and then finding a way to deploy that out to your routing infrastructure can actually help you in the future stop those types of attacks from coming forward. Um, and so that's something uh, that, that, again, since it's the, the good news is if you're attacking the application, then you've had a full TCP handshake which means that you've got an authenticated host on the other side, which means that you can then assign a reputation to the IP address of that host, and that reputation can be trusted and followed. Thank you, Matt. Next question, question is back to Dr. Richard. Matt Prince discussed the difficulty in mitigating Layer 7 attacks. How is this problem intensified when the attack is targeting SSL? And what holistic strategies are effective against a Layer 7 SSL attack? 
and there's a couple of follow-up questions um, concerning the same as to how the SSL attack mitigation is going to be handled from a privacy compliance standpoint and what can a small medium business do to defend themselves from this emerging threat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of tough questions. Uh, at the uh, IPv6 and uh, the IPsec and SSL world, so it's a challenge for the traditional uh, network security uh, appliances, devices to handle uh, the uh, encrypted packets uh, in a traditional way. Uh, so talking about the uh, mitigating layer 7 DDoS attacks uh, with the uh, uh, SSL-enabled website, uh, it's a challenge for the architect to design the, uh, the choke point for the, all the traffic to go going through and uh, choose the uh, appliance with the SSL or EPSEC accelerated uh, chips or um, enhanced, uh, enhanced um, devices to uh, make sure the performance uh, of the device won't be uh, a bottleneck of the, of the whole system. Uh, as the uh, holistic strategy um, to fight against the layer 7 SSL attacks, uh, we need to um, consider not only the, uh, the layer 7, uh, the uh, TCP IP, but from the whole stack uh, of, the, uh, of the system. Uh, uh, for example, at the, uh, uh, according to our current research at, at the uh, IPv6, uh, during the about 110 CVE vulnerabilities of IPv6, uh, more than half of them could be exploited to conduct the DDoS attacks. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenge to adopt IPv6 and uh, make sure uh, all the network devices along the critical path uh, are equipped with the uh, latest uh, version uh, of the software to uh, remove uh, all the vulnerabilities. Uh, this is one aspect to uh, mitigate to all fight against the layer, layer 7 SSL attack. While we need to tune all the, uh, the parameters uh, along the critical path, including the, uh, the switch, uh, the routers, and the servers, this is also very important. But it, it, it requires uh, very deep uh, expertise for those parameters. And, uh, maybe uh, uh, in, uh, the uh, general administrator need to work together with security experts on this domain. Um, <laughs> and for the third question, it's a privacy compliant perspective. That's related to the first question. So that means from the architecture perspective, uh, in general, uh, the encrypted, encrypted packets need to be uh, decrypted and do the general secure check and re uh, re encrypted and re uh, uh, into the stream. So this brings challenges for the uh, complex requirement, for example, PSI, PCI DSS. Uh, that means that in the middle, uh, in the checking point or the uh, IPsec checking point, uh, needed to protect this point. Uh, at the full stack. So, Doctor, what you're stating is that under a SSL attack at layer 7, those packets have to be decrypted, and that brings new concerns for um, compliance in PCI. Oh, uh, yeah. In, in order to inspect the, the packets, they need to decrypt. So, this gives a cost for the uh, attackers to penetrate into this server or this device and get the data. Uh, so, this uh, becomes a bottleneck of the uh, the shortest one in the, uh, in the uh, right. chain. So not only is it a difficult challenge, but in the process of decryption, you could actually be opening yourself up to additional regulatory concerns. Yes. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Mind if I add something? Go ahead, Carlos. Now, I've, I've had the opportunity to talk to a few CSOs from some of the major banks. And, and frankly, for, especially from a PCI compliance, which is the primary one that, uh, that has this implication because of the banking industry and, uh, and SSL and credit card information. Uh, there's a lot of, of, uh, of disagreement over what the PCI compliance actually states and or dictates. Some of them say that you cannot 
uh, decrypt the packets anywhere other than in the final server that's actually terminating the, the, uh, the messages. Other CSOs of, again, major banks are saying, no, while you're within the same data center, you can decrypt the packets, do what you need to do and, and do it. Um, I, prefer, I prefer the latter implication because it actually gives you an opportunity to do something from a security perspective. Um, yeah. And it seems that the law on this, or the, co the compliance law isn't completely, uh, uh, let's say, explicit on it. So uh, I think in, in a lot of cases, you can kind of work with your customers and, and with the banking auditors that, that they deal with to, to determine what the best thing to do. Um, frankly, from a security perspective, the only solution is to decrypt uh, look at the packet, do, do the work on it, then, then re-encrypt it. Thank you, Carlos. Next question is from Matt Mavi on behalf of Kevin Hatfield. Uh, Matt Mavi, again, Staminus Communications. Discuss how a hosting provider system administrator would secure a Linux system to protect against CDOS attacks, and what limitations exist when using a single server or bastion host as an availability security practice, and what additional implications exist when using Windows? So I'm going to open up with saying don't run Windows if you want to stay up against DOS attacks. It's not going to work. It's, just, it's never going to work. You're not going to get it to work. Now, on a single server, how much time have you guys got? We can run through a lot of commands. But basically, at the end of the day, when you want to secure a single Linux box, you're talking about a whole bunch of stuff. A lot of real simple stuff, block out ports you don't need. So if you don't need port 443, why do you have it open? Block it out. Block out every single port you don't need then you probably want to turn on things like sin cookies. So let's say on Linux, you turn on sin cookies, that's going to protect you a lot from unopen, from just like half open sin connection. When they send a sin, you send a cookie out, it's got to respond with an act. Um, you can do a lot more with IP tables and a lot more complicated firewalls. So if anybody here has ever used IP tables, you go into like hash limits and recent matches, a lot more complex matches like that. And you can put together something really simple in under 30 lines and make it work really well. Um, you can go into even more detail than that. You can actually run user space apps to dump the traffic using Linux socket filters, for example, and extract that traffic, look at, the, look at that data, and drop it into, let's say, an IP set to block, uh, block the traffic that you detect to be bad. The one thing you guys never want to run is you never want to run a whole bunch of IP tables because it is a sequential algorithm. So you're going to run like 100 rules in there and you're going to run 50,000 packets a second through it. It's going to bring the box to a halt even if you're blocking stuff. So there's stuff you can do with a single server to start to really block a lot of traffic. Uh, you can look at hardware, for example. I mean, you don't want to run Broadcom mix. You want to run Intel mix, something where the IRQ doesn't destroy it, something that's running nappy, something that's running uh, some kind of IRQ throttling. So a lot of little technical details that go into this. Uh, a lot of this stuff, Windows just does not have, and you just really can't do much with Windows. So I guess that's really it. I mean, there's a lot that you can do, but at the end of the day, your limitation is going to be the performance of the single server to handle both the end user load and the mitigation that you're going to be doing. So let's say you want to mitigate you know, 50,000 packets a second. You can drop Nginx in front of Apache, and that will possibly take 50,000 with some IP tables rules. But anything over that, you're talking about, at that point, let's say 100 meg ports limitation at about like 100, 150,000 packets a second, depending on the packet sizes. Even on a gigabit port, you're really not going to be picking up a lot more bad traffic. Uh, because you just don't have enough CPU. So let's say you throw in like a dual hex score, sure now you have some more CPU to handle that, but at what point do you then throw an extra server in front of it to dedicate the processing? Thank you, Matt. The, um, the, so just to, to put a fine point on it, the most, so that, I think that's all exactly right. The, the combination that we've seen that gives us the best performance, and the best that we've gotten to is on a single server, with a 10 gig NIC, and we're you and again, the the cards that we've seen that get the best performance by far are Solar Flare cards, which is primarily they're in a high frequency trading space, and you can they have really big buffers in them, so we can get about 1.5 million packets per second on a box with a 10 gig uh, NIC, and 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 essentially the Linux configured uh, that way, you can actually get slightly higher performance per second if you use some of the BSD variants as their network stack, the way that it pulls against the network card can get you actually slightly higher performance than that. But 1.5 million packets per second on a single Linux box is, is pretty good. And the solar flare cards are getting cheap enough that certainly for some scrubbing boxes, they can, they can make a lot of sense. Thank you, Matt.
Can I actually ask another? So on those, are you actually servicing HTTP at 1.5 million a second, or are you servicing SYN packets? So it's uh, we're so we that's SYN it's SYN packets. So that's the packets to to do that to get that back to you. I uh, I we don't have any of that in production to do. This this is all this is all kind of labs stuff for us. But our next generation hardware will be will be out at, at probably around that. And it will, but it will be less than one point five. You might days. actually be able to achieve that if you're just doing blocking. You can actually achieve over a million packets a second on a gigabit Intel NIC. So you don't even need to go into ten gigabits. So Linux and BSC can all they can all block at line rate. Uh, but it really becomes more complicated when you get into layer seven. That's really where the majority of attacks are. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Let's keep moving so we can make sure that we have time to get to the um, audience questions. Um, Carlos, this question is for you. What is the role of on-premise DDoS mitigation systems? And when should a web hosting provider consider making that purchase? And are there instances where other solutions may be more appropriate? OK, so I, I guess the first thing you have to consider is what, what, what is your business? And what's the import of the internet on your business? Right? So as a, as, as a case in point, right? You, a lot of people invest a lot of money in fire extinguishers for, uh, for the purposes of keeping the availability of a data center from you don't want it to burn down, therefore you're not available. Very similarly, DDoS is a threat to availability uh, of, of your internet services, right? So if a DDoS happens, and it's a likely case with the likes of Anonymous and other, other vigilante groups that will drop a DDoS attack on you for uh, insulting uh, whatever on, on Facebook, uh, the, the, you have to then figure out, OK, what is the, the, the subsequent impact on my business from a monetary perspective? If I sell stuff online, if I'm a retail provider, um, it's a pretty significant impact. For every minute of downtime, uh, let's say, for, for instance, you're Amazon.com uh, or your XYZ.com. For every minute of downtime, it's lost revenue. It's customer churn. It's, it's that. So the, the primary consideration when you start looking at whether or not you want DDoS defense is what is the impact of your business for an outage? OK, great. So we've established that DDoS is, is, uh, is impactful to me. Uh, if, I, if I have an outage, it's going to cost me X. And that's going to dictate what you might have as a solution or what you might be able to consider as a solution. The next step really is to determine how, how big is your bandwidth. What's your, what's your overhead bandwidth? Meaning I, I have a gig link and I run a 100 meg. OK, great. You have some amount of bandwidth to withstand a DDoS attack. Or I have a 50 meg link and I've got I, I, I've got a 50 meg link and I'm running 45 meg at peak. Well, you don't have a lot of bandwidth uh, for, for DDoS. So I would say that the higher amount of, of shunt bandwidth or the amount of extra excess bandwidth that you have on your prem makes it more likely that you're going to be have success with some type of on-prem DDoS solution uh, as, as a solution. If you don't have the overhead, you don't have the bandwidth, then you really have to look towards your upstream providers who have bigger pipes who can withstand a, a larger attack to, to do that. Um, and I'll say this throughout, but uh, DDoS itself is an ecosystem because even though, even if you have huge pipes, there's a there's a botnet out there that can take you down. I, I don't care if you're 100 gigs worth of vet, worth, worth of internet bandwidth. Well, I've seen a 250 gig attack. So uh, I, the uh, it's it's I, they they that that in and of itself is is not a, or having a, a prem solution isn't a, an end to a means of, of itself. So you have to look at. Um, how much you have, whether or not on-prem makes sense given that, and then look to, uh, to having some type of upstream provider to help you with, uh, with it if you don't. Uh, oh, so if I'm understanding you correctly, sure. as an ecosystem, there's multiple different, different solutions. So an on-premise system is one part of that ecosystem. Then maybe the cloud security provider is another part of that ecosystem, or perhaps the enterprise DDoS solution. And when you string it all together, it provides that holistic defense in depth. Correct. Yeah, so, so you, you got to look at it like, um, you have, you have locks on your doors. You do stuff locally at, at your house, right, to protect your, your house. You have a neighborhood watch. That's kind of a broader, the cloud service provider. And you have maybe the police force. That's the, uh, that's the enterprise-based uh, carrier solution, right? You, you want to have multiple layers of depth for the type of threat that, that, that might come at you. That's Great. Thank you. And here is your, graph, your supporting graphic, Carlos. Yeah, th this sort of shows um, a little bit of what I meant by ecosystem, right? So, 
pretty, presumably most of you guys or all of you guys are, are hosting providers, which means that you, you have a bunch of customers behind you, you have some amount of, of, uh, of, of bandwidth to the internet. Depending on the size of that bandwidth, it makes sense for you guys to have something that you can offer to your customers as a value-added solution on, on your own prem, something you guys could run and, uh, and, and provide uh, deeper and uh, maybe services to your customers to protect them from, uh, from threats. The less bandwidth you have, uh, and or even if you have a lot of bandwidth, there ne there's a need to actually work with uh, people who have bigger bandwidth. You know, the AT&T, the Verizons, uh, or the Black Lotuses of the world, right? That, that have more, more bandwidth at their, uh, at their disposal to be able to, uh, to take that DDoS attack and not have it actually even hit your, your data center. So uh, the, the only real solution to this problem is to have an ecosystem in place. Uh, that would include on-prem if it makes sense, and some type of, of upstream uh, help. Thank you, Carlos. Go ahead, doctor. Um, the anti-DDoS uh, technology or the devices um, is much more dynamic uh, than the traditional firewall. Actually, it's more close to the IPS or IDS system. That means it uh, should be uh, updated uh, very promptly according to the latest threats. That means the security intelligence and the research team um, with the 24 by 7 respons responsiveness is very critical uh, for the effectiveness uh, of the anti-DDoS system or services. So this is also the key part of the ecosystem uh, I mentioned. Thank you, doctor. I, I would absolutely agree with that. I, I think that that's a strong consideration when you choose the technology and or the upstream provider that you work with is uh, not only what they have, how much can they process, but what ex expertise they have in the area, uh, what they have, how, how often they, they, they actually mitigate attacks, uh, what type of research capabilities do they have, do they have, re do they have subscriber reputation field, uh, capabilities like what, like what we, uh, these gentlemen have already spoken of. So th those are definitely strong considerations as you're choosing a product or a service. Thank you, Carlos. We're becoming low on time, and I want to make sure that we have enough time to speak with the audience and get the answers to the questions that um, are important to you all. So I'm going to wrap up with one question that I'm going to direct to Matt Prince at Cloudflare. Matt, cloud mitigation solutions are becoming increasingly popular, as you're well aware. Where do these solutions fit in administrator's toolbox? When is it and when is it not appropriate to use cloud mitigation? And are there instances where self-defense tactics or the on-premise hardware may be a more appropriate solution? Uh, so, so I think that of all the security challenges, um, DDoS mitigation is the one that if you, were, if you were only going to do one thing or the other, it makes the most sense um, to do from the cloud as opposed to doing on-premise. And, and, and th this would be, a, a, we, we can all fight about this um, later. Um, the reason why are twofold. Um, the first is that in the cloud, again, DDoS is all about resource exhaustion. And so uh, however large your connection to the internet is, um, we are able to do some things that you're just not able to do. The first is um, that we can use something like Anycast, which is a technology that allows us to uh, distribute, or any cloud provider, to distribute load across many, many, many different uh, systems. So every one of the data centers that someone like we run or Prolexic or other, other large um, cloud providers uh, will announce the exact same IP set. And so if you have a big botnet, instead of us having to deal with the entire botnet hitting one router somewhere, we have that deal to deal with that hitting 23 different routers scattered fairly evenly across, across the world. So for example, in our case, we're building POPs in China, not so much to service the Chinese market, but to be black holes where when attacks come out of China, they hit there and they just stay there. And that's, that's a huge solution to, to problems like that. That's the one thing, and, and that's very easy to understand in terms of you just have more resources that are spread across more clients if, if, you're, if you're in the cloud. The um, piece that is, is less obvious is that the, the way to solve this, the problem with the security industry generally is that we all learn lessons and then we hide them in our own organizations and keep that information siloed. And, we, and the bad guys don't do that. The bad guys are actually working together and coordinating 
in order to find new vulnerabilities and share them. And so the power of a cloud-based solution, if it's built correctly, is that the system can actually get smarter from one attack protecting other attacks. And so my favorite example of this is a little bit off color, which was that when about at this time last year, we had a bunch of customers that just happened to be Turkish escort sites. They didn't pay us anything. They were terrible customers. Um, but they all signed up for us and they got these enormous attacks because in Turkey, you have a relatively conservative population which finds Turkish escort sites abhorrent. And so they you know, knock them off offline. Um, and our system just automatically learned about the nature of that. And this is, again, the characteristics of any well-engineered cloud-based solution. And that as a result of that, because we saw that, we were able to later service you know, small businesses in Turkey and then larger businesses in Turkey and then major media publications in Turkey. And now the, every government website in Turkey uses Cloudflare in order to help protect themselves. And that's because we started out learning about attacks from Turkish escort sites that weren't particularly good customers. <coughs> And so the power of the cloud for doing something like DDoS mitigation is not only that you have an enormous amount of resources, but that you can learn from every attack which comes through your system in a way which is much more difficult for an on-premise solution. So I would never say rip your on-premise solution out. In fact, the more layers of this that you have, so long as you're not introducing latency, the better you're going to be. But if, if I, the way that I have come to think about DDoS mitigation is start out at the cloud first and then work your way back if there's something that isn't being solved by someone who's in a cloud service provider. Thank you, Matt. We have about seven minutes for question and answer, so I'm going to go ahead and um, skip to our final slide, which is a, another supporting graphic from Arbor Networks that shows the um, kind of historical data on DDoS attacks and the uh, motivations behind them. But, um, does anyone in our audience have a question for the panel? Sir. Yes. No, and it was pointed out to me that there is one type, well, there, actually there are a couple, but there's one common uh, attack which is, which is a layer 7 attack that can be forged, which is a DNS reflection attack, where there are a bunch of requests that go to a DNS, and then it and then it can and then it can bounce back um, to you. And that's probably 8.8.8.8 is one of the Google uh, public DNS resolvers, and they're able to do that. What we do in cases like that is we call Google, and we and we're able to work with their. I mean, they, they, I I know the head of their DDoS mitigation team. Um, and, and that's harder to do if you're an individual host, but if you have an, a sufficient traffic, they take these things really, really seriously, and, and they're willing to work with you to say, basically, don't send this traffic to, to our particular um, uh, sites, or wall that off if, you're, if you wouldn't be expecting traffic to come in from resolvers. But the problem of open resolvers is, is still a significant problem, and we, uh, you know, our, part of our security team spends a significant amount of time contacting those um, resolver providers and saying, hey, you know, even if you want to run an open resolver, firewall it off from, from parts of our network. Thank you, Matt. Next question. Sir. So I can cover that if you want. Go ahead, Carlos. So Ar Arbor does, has done a lot of business traditionally with subscriber networks, uh, whether you call you have mobile networks or cable modem networks or the traditional ISPs that do DSL, which are a lot of the sources for these types of attacks. Yes, your answer in, in, in a utopian point of view is absolutely. You, you, you block the attack right at the user. In fact, you, you, uh, I, I mean, ideally, you keep the, the PCs from being infected. Okay, well, for, let Symantec, McAfee, they've been trying to do that for years. That's, that's not really probable. The next is, okay, you, you stop those PCs from actually sending the traffic to begin with. That is very possible, especially because I think the characteristics for DDoS are pretty well known, uh, especially in some of the more common attacks. And even a lot of the application layer attacks now have very common characteristics, uh, like the LOIC tool, for instance, is, uh, is very easily characterized. I think all of us at this, at this table probably have characterized the LOIC tool uh, that Anonymous uses. The problem is motivation now. So typically, a broadband provider, a mobile provider, gets $50 a month per subscriber. Okay. Uh, if you block that subscriber, for whatever reason, that subscriber is going to call your help desk. If you, brought, if you block a bunch of subscribers, they, block, they, they call your help desk. 
And suddenly, you're, every time they call your help desk, you're looking at maybe four months worth of, uh, worth of their $50 a month that you've just lost just by fielding that call. So the broadband provider has zero motivation to actually go and do this, to do anything about this at the subscriber level, and, or spend the money to do it and the infrastructure, because it's pretty broad. You know, you look at a Comcast footprint throughout the US, um, it, it's got points of presence throughout all the 50 states, all over the place, it's pretty broad. If you look at you know, China Telecom, for instance, a, a billion subscribers on the China Telecom network or approaching a billion subscribers, it, it's just a gigantic footprint across the country. So there's no real value for them to invest the, the millions of dollars that it would take to try to, to, uh, to block those subscribers from doing bad stuff when it'll only cost them more in the long run. Uh, so they're not really motivated to do it. Uh, that, that's really the crux of the problem. So it falls upon the intermediate service providers who do more managed services, uh, the cloud providers, and then the, the, the people who actually own the services who are deeply impacted by it. That, that, that's really, that's a reality. It's, it's, your statement is absolutely true. It's just not, I, I think it just doesn't do, happen from a business-centric. Thank you, Carlos. Um, I have a question myself, actually, for Dr. Zhao. Matt Prince had made a comment about offloading DDoS attacks within China. And since you've studied in China and first um, got into the business in China, I was hoping you could add your commentary. In, in terms of Cloudflare's network, to use an example, Matt Prince had stated that they're actually able to, um, to sync DDoS attacks from a China pop. And I was hoping you could give me your experience with that, since a lot of the attacks do tend to come from those carriers. Oh, yeah. Uh, I checked the latest report, CERES report, uh, China together with the U.S., uh, mostly uh, at the top two uh, in the uh, uh, EDAS attacks traffic uh, worldwide. Uh, China, uh, the major three carriers of China, uh, are top the carriers with uh, most subscribers worldwide, and they have the uh, largest bandwidth in total worldwide. So uh, together with the uh, large number of botnet uh, that means controlled by CNSA worldwide. Uh, so this very uh, uh, se uh, severe threat, uh, even inside China, uh, in, you know, uh, the uh, attacks to, uh, to the internet, uh, internet operators, to the game operators, uh, uh, so uh, from the the technological perspective, uh, the carrier like to uh, investigate uh, some some means to remove the malware, control the botnet, clean the uh, the, the, the MAN, uh, the uh, the call network, and try to uh, provide the, the value added security protection services to their subscribers, and also leveraging the. Uh, in cyber placement uh, to help them uh, mitigate, remove the uh, malware. You know, carrier doesn't have no legal enforcement rights. When even the uh, find some subscribers are attacking others, they cannot do any. Uh, they can do nothing. They cannot block the subscriber from the network. Uh, all they can do, they ask the placement to do that. So this is a job of a third uh, under the China Internet uh, Consortium. It's, uh, uh, it's maybe uh, similar to the third uh, US, US third. Uh, they have to coordinate the carrier, the security providers, and the legal enforcement enforcer. So I'm understanding you have considerable amount of experience with um, a lot of DDoS attacks that are originating from China. So a strategy like putting a um, a pop in place in China to sink a DDoS attack is a, a sound idea? Um, it might be a part of the solution. Part of the solution. We are short on time. I want to wrap up with I, I the final. I want to ask a counter question to that. Is it, we deal with a whole lot of providers that connect directly with China providers. Uh, none of them have, have, what, been, have put up a pop in China. Um, and we're talking about all the transit providers in Hong Kong, Japan, all, all this sort of uh, pan, pan Asian, even kind of European, all, all the guys that have the, the international links from China. Uh, I'm not sure if there's regulatory uh, reasons why they can't put up a pop in China. And, and a lot of the Chinese companies, China Unicom, China Telecom, 
don't have a lot of motivation to actually provide a service outbound. Um, or at least they, they, all of these guys have been frustrated for the last few years on that. So I, I, I think that there's regulatory issues of, of putting up that pocket. Perhaps in Hong I, Kong? I think, it, well, Hong, you Hong Kong... You can't keep, you can't keep China, China traffic in Hong Kong. Hong Kong, Hong Kong China links are actually more expensive than Trans-Pacific links. Right. So I, I've had a Hong Kong-based carrier oh. actually do their DDoS mitigation in the U.S. from China, uh, basically route their traffic through the U.S., mitigate it there, mm -hmm. right to go back to Hong Kong. I, so it's so huge it's cost considerations. So, and, yeah. the, and so the answer, if, 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 I mean, maybe this is inside baseball, but is the way that you get a pop in China is you spend a lot of time making friends with China Telecom and every regulator and every possible thing because they're, they're the regulatory. It, it's just not like this is this is what I spend all my day doing. I literally have a member of my team whose job is figure out China. Um, and and we hired like Google's old lawyer. I mean, it's there's it's, it is non-trivial to do this, but that's the solution. Is you have to get closer to the attacks. And so the question of do you can, the solution is should the care should the actual ISPs block it? Yes, they're not going to. So then, what should you do? You you need to block it as close to the source as possible. And so for you as hosts, what you need to do is have incredibly good relationships with your transit providers so that you can call them up when there is an attack and block things further and further and further upstream. And so, you know, like we choose transit providers based on what routers they have and whether they will let us announce black hole routes up to them. And that's, I mean, it's, those are the sorts of strategies that, that you know, thinking through are really important if, you, if you're putting it Thank you, Matt. We are short on time. I have one final question for you, Matt. Matt right, Mavi. Sure, go ahead. The next big threat, what is it? What are we going to do about it? Okay, so before I go into that, there's a new paradigm shift where uh, it costs so much to transport the bandwidth out of China that Chinese providers actually buy the on-prem equipment that uh, companies sell and flip it the other way and block DDoS outbound, which is really cool. So that's a brand new paradigm shift a lot of companies are now doing. This only happens in, company, in networks and areas of the world where transport just costs way too much. Uh, next threat. I'm waiting for that one. Couldn't tell you, man. Sure. You've been my colleague for over a decade now, so yeah. I was hoping you can give us some insight as to uh, <laughs> what it is that we're not seeing here Slow on the panel. Slow attacks. Attacks that look like people. That's it. They're layer seven. They're slow. You can't tell that they're attacks unless you have a massive, massive infrastructure that can detect it. Something like what, what, Cloud, uh, what Matt was talking about, Cloudflare, or what Arbor does, or you know, what NS Focus does. Basically, a massive infrastructure to take a lot of information and run a lot of analysis on it to determine whether this, uh, this one IP that's sending just a few requests every few seconds, every 30 seconds, is an attack. You might have to spend hours detecting some IP that's an attack, but you can't if you're just one guy, if you're just one pop. It doesn't work very well. That's, my guess is that's going to be the next best thing, because it's easy to detect if you've got you know, 100,000 packets a second coming in from one IP or, or even a few IPs. It's all sin flood. But when it all looks the same as your regular traffic, oh man, that sucks. That's what really gets you right there. Thank you, Matt. We are over on time. I'd like to thank you all for coming out. For our audience, if you'd please direct yourself to m.hostingcon.com. You can give your feedback for the panel. That is extremely important to us. It's extremely important to INET. Um, your comments will drive the next session for next, next year. So if we're going to talk about DDoS next year, your comments are going to determine how that's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for the uh, last minute.